Okay, welcome everybody. As we start to see people fill in, so I'm gonna give it 30 seconds as people are filling in. Um, excited to see everybody today for this Transportation and Mobility Tech Showcase. Hopefully you have your afternoon coffee as I do. Um, we're expecting quite an audience today. Um, we're gonna start with a little poll for those of you who are in and listening. Um, but we are expecting federal government representatives on the civilian and defense side. We are expecting state and local government representatives. We are expecting industry firms and industry uh, committees, standards committees, standards organizations, um, and a number of other groups related to transportation and mobility. I'm very excited uh, to be here today. So we're going to give people about 30 seconds to filter in, and then we're going to kick right off. Um, I do want to give a shout out to, as I look through the attendance list, um, I do want to give a shout out to all my friends here in the state of Michigan. I saw a lot of Michigan folks um, uh, represented here today in our audience, which is great. I'm sitting in Sterling Heights, Michigan. I saw the American Center for Mobility. Um, saw University of Michigan um, and a number of other groups that are working in the mobility space and our friends from all around the country as well. Um, welcome to everybody. Again, 15 seconds and then I'm going to kick off and we're going to start right into our programming. And so as you are filing in, I'm going to go ahead and start discussing what we're all about. And so as I said, my name is Ben McMartin. Uh, I'm the managing partner at Public Spend Forum. I would like to thank um, all of the hardworking folks at Public Spend Forum, AKA Jack Kinney, who did all the work to ultimately set up um, and bring these folks together. And of course, we would like to thank ITS America, who ultimately is our partner in presenting this content today. Um, so today we have an awesome lineup of speakers. Uh, you're going to hear from Kristen White from ITS America. You're going to hear from two of Public Spend Forum's other partner organizations, Jason Cahill from Amazon Web Services and David Weinstein from Freshwater Advisors. And then you're going to hear from four fantastic technology firms working in the transportation and mobility space. Uh, Christina Ascorby nailed it. Reed Zagetti nailed that name, Chuck Stockton, and Jamie Gull, much easier names to say. Looks like I rocked all of those as expected. Um, if you don't know about Public Spend Forum, Public Spend Forum is a market intelligence firm that works at the intersection of public markets and industry. And what we do is we leverage the power of data to provide visibility into public markets for technology firms, services firms, construction firms, uh, small businesses and large businesses alike. Um, you can see a number of partners that we worked with on the Department of Defense side, on the civilian side of federal government, state and local governments, as well as commercial entities. Um, over, overall in our network, we have over 250 federal, state and local government organizations leveraging uh, the public spend forum ecosystem. And we have, over 2.5 million suppliers in our technology tool, GovShop. So if you don't have a GovShop profile, it is free. Take your company on over to GovShop.com, sign up for a free company profile and get your company in front of government buyers across the world. All right, so how can public spend forum support your government agency and or private company in finding each other? Well, I'll tell you through the power of data, Public Spend Forum, leveraging our tool govshop.com are able to provide market intelligence into who buys what I sell. That sounds like an easy question. It is not. Uh, across the federal government, there are over 2 million acquisition professionals at any given time buying services and products and new technologies. 
through the power of data, GovShop in public spend forms able to identify for companies who buys what I sell, where what's your market product fit to sell to the federal government on defense, civilian, or state and local government. For agencies, who are the technology providers out there providing the cutting edge technology in the area that you're responsible for? Uh, we have over two and a half million companies. 1.3 of those are non-traditional, non-public market sector companies. So if you're looking for tech scouting into what the state of the art is and who those companies are, including emerging tech, di diverse, in, in diverse companies as well, um, we have over 1.3 million catalog suppliers in those categories. All right, you've heard enough from me. Um, it's time to get into to what Public Spend Forum does and, and talk about our partners and get to those pitches. Um, before we get there, one thing I want to identify is that Public Spend Forum is currently working with Amazon Web Services and Freshwater Advisors on a transportation and mobility accelerator for companies. The closing date of that is this Friday for folks that want to apply. This is a wonderful opportunity and you don't have to take it from me because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass it over to my counterpart, Jason Cahill at Amazon Web Services and David Weinstein at Freshwater Advisors and let them tell you about the Accelerator. Jason. Well, thanks, Ben. Um, and great to e meet everybody on the, uh, the chat today. So AWS Sustainable Cities is a platform to really help accelerate the customer growth. Um, so when you think accelerator, don't think of the sort of model of stand on stage, pitch to receive income. Our model is all about customer growth. So much like pub public spend forum, say that three times fast, much like public spend forum is really focused at that intersection of markets and technologies, we too are trying to drive that experience. Over time, AWS has acquired um, many customers. And as they're going through their journey and that build or buy question, the minute they look to industry to buy solutions, uh, our, our platform is really looking to help leverage that. Um, and David, over to you to perhaps some of the more specific things. Sure. Thank you, Jason and Ben. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet all you folks electronically. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the accelerator, but let me give you a little background on Freshwater. And, and in a past life, I was the chief technology officer for the city of Chicago. So I've always been at the intersection of, per, of procuring um, technology solutions for government to move the needle. And what we do at Freshwater, which is a nine-year-old business, is we are a national tech scouting organization connecting large corporations to startup ecosystems. We have a heavy focus in the energy space, so we run a lot of different programs to basically drive co-creation of solutions. So that being said, let us tell you a little bit about this accelerator, and we're excited to be here with our friend and also meet the folks from ITS, who's a partner in the accelerator, which you'll hear a little bit more of in a minute. The accelerator, as Jason said, is not your tr traditional accelerator, which could be a three to six month program and a huge commitment, which are wonderful, that comes with a little bit of investment for an equity position in your company. So two things here. No equity exchange here. It's a financially free accelerator, but AWS is putting on the table $100,000 in Activate credits for companies selected into the accelerator. This is a six-week accelerator, so it's a, it is a much more condensed and outcome-driven accelerator for participants. It is for more mature businesses. It's not for companies with one or two people. It's for companies from seed round to seed, seed round to about seed round in the financing stack, five employees up to 200, where we're gonna select companies that are providing mobility and transportation solutions. And I would like Jack to put into the chat a link to actually the accelerator so you folks can actually see it now. Public Spend Forum and Freshwater were the partners delivering this accelerator. And we're coming on the heels of a successful first cohort last year. And I always like to share an outcome so that it gives you some context. And uh, hi, it's great to see Raj. 
And one of the outcomes, we ran this accelerator last cycle in, in, the, in the summer of last year. And one of the companies in um, eZinc uh, that provides long duration battery storage, which is critical, as you know, for electrification and multiple things. They participate, they were one of 10 companies that participated in the accelerator. They were connected to an Italian utility, um, Italian, an Italian uh, utility and energy company, um, any after the accelerator, any just invested and participated as part of a $20 million, $25 million financing round. That happened because of their connectivity in the accelerator. So our goal in the accelerator is to connect solutions with customers on the public sector side, state, federal, and local, and that's where public spend form is putting all their resources on the table, as well as commercial partners that can be part of partnership solutions to deploying these solutions. The areas that we're looking at are EV electrification, um, route optimization, anything that improves transportation and mobility in urban centers. It is uh, we're accepting applications from around the world. The accelerator, the commitment for the accelerator is literally over this five or six week period, uh, five to 10 hours of programming a week. So we know you've at that stage of companies we're targeting, we know that you have other things to do. So we're trying to make this experience immersive and, outpat, uh, and outcome driven. And uh, we're very excited about it. So I encourage folks to learn more, go into the link, and you're meeting the team here that's delivering it between Freshwater, PSF, ITS, as well as other partners that we have with all the support and background of AWS, their technical resources. Our goal is to drive outcomes and impact. So um, I've had my coffee this morning, and so you get to hear a little of my passion. And we're really excited to be part of the beautiful network at PSF um, along with ITS. And we think this program, it is outcome driven and impact driven as Raj always said. So hopefully you'll get some more information and we encourage you to apply by midnight central time this Friday and please look in the chat. And also please feel free to go ahead and send this out to your respective networks. The quality of the program is always determined by the applicant pool. And I think we're coming off the heels of a great first cohort. And the key thing is with AWS, they're committing to this for a long time. And so we're gonna have multiple cycles on this. So um, that's my piece. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing from you. And it's, delighting to, it's delightful to be part of this um, panel today. All right, thanks, thanks. David. Thanks, Jason. Um, Hey, um, Ben, one thing I'll just add related to that, David and Jason, we discussed is even the companies that are not selected, we're going to be offering them some other ways to participate as well. So there'll be benefits for companies that who are not selected. So we would encourage you to apply. And if you think that maybe you won't get selected, but we would still encourage you to apply because there'll be other benefits for everyone that comes into our network. So sorry, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, for, for your... For you East Coast procrastinators, I heard midnight central time, which means one o'clock in the morning for me. That's that's perfect. I like that one o'clock in the morning deadline. Um, but this is serious. Why not apply? As Raj said, you know, participation in the ecosystem gets you on the radar of a number of companies, even if you're not in the cohort. Why wouldn't you apply? Um, so let's let's not delay any further. Uh, you heard about the cohort. Thanks, thanks, Raj. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jason. I want to move on and talk to our partner for for today's uh, webinar and pitches, which is Kristen White from ITS America. Kristen, I want to know a little bit about ITS America and why we're here today and what we're going to hear. We'll talk about a cohort of acceleration, everyone. I am honored to be here today as the Chief Operating Officer of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America. And I have the honor of not only introducing uh, our work and our vision to all of you, but I get to lay the foundation for the four innovators you're going to hear from today. Velodyne, Spoke, Valor, and Talon are not unique to accelerating new innovations in this future mobility ecosystem. And all of these folks that you're going to hear about in just a few moments all together help this ecosystem to advance our vision, which is a better future transformed by intelligent mobility that is safer, greener, 
smarter and more equitable. And what we mean by that is we know that technologies like the ones you're going to hear about, LIDAR technologies, sensing te technologies, automation that can predict where humans are in the built environment and even automated air mobility and beyond help save lives and eliminate the enormous challenge of traffic fatalities in our road system. These technologies help promote a more sustainable, resilient society and global future. And these technologies also help grow access to opportunity for those who need it most, including Americans who have been so underserved in the past two years and beyond. So at ITS America, we were founded 31 years ago in 1991 as a nonprofit advisory council to the US Department of Transportation as the country was starting to learn about how technology was the future of transportation and innovation. And so our services are complementary to our partner, Public Spend Forum. We have a technical programs department which advances research and development does thoughtful trends analyses and helps convene in professional training and capacity building. We have an advocacy and policy department that helps understand where the new emerging trends in regulatory and legislative affairs are and helps understand what that ecosystem of policy needs to look like, including our six standing advisory committees, which focus on six key topics, including automated vehicles, connected vehicles, the smart infrastructures that supports this ecosystem, other emerging technologies like the ones you'll hear about today, mobility as a service and seamless mobility, and of course, sustainable and resilient technologies. As a member-based organization, we include as a, the only nonprofit in America that combines the thought leadership from the public sector, private sector, academia, and nonprofits. With over 245 members that represent tens of millions of transportation and infrastructure jobs globally, our members include major auto manufacturers, some of the tech startups like Velodyne and Spoke, which are emerging into some of the global leaders in this space, as well as the public sector that needs to learn about these innovations, which is why we're partnering today with Public Spend Forum. Public sector leaders like state departments of transportation, metropolitan planning organizations, city and transit organizations that are trying to leverage innovation and technology technology to think towards tomorrow as they build today. Again, we are the only organization in the country that combines all of these different public, private, and other leaders so that we can come to consensus on how we advance innovation nationally for infrastructure, transportation, and the future. With that, I just want to conclude with a few of the opportunities to join ITS America. I want to share in the chat box our website, itsa.org, where you can learn more about our standing committees, how to become a member, and how to become some of the thought leaders like you're going to hear about just shortly. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ben so we can hear from the experts. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, wonderful organization. I, obviously, this is something that you, if your company is working this area, or if your agency or organization is working in this area, you want to be keeping up to date on trends, changes in policy, upcoming changes in technology. Um, this is how you stay on top of markets is by engaging in groups such as ITS America. All right, so we're here, we made it. We got it to the pitches. And if anybody has ever been to a public spend forum tech showcase before, you know that we're serious about pitches and we're serious about get in in five minutes and don't make me yank you off the stage pitches. And we have four fantastic companies today that know how to do that. Get in, talk about what's great about their company and then get out, which ultimately, ultimately means for those involved today, those in the audience today, these companies uh, are open to talk to anybody and everyone about what their technology is. So you're going to hear five minutes on the company. You're going to get to know a little bit about their technology solution, who they're working with and what problems they're solving. And then reach out, please, by all means, reach out to each one of these companies. We'll be dropping information in the chat as they breathe. All right. First up, I want to introduce Christina Ascorby from Velodyne. And Christina is going to tell us a little bit about her solution. Christina, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you, Ben and Kristen and Raj for the um, ex excellent uh, introduction and the, int uh, the invitation to share here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get that up and running. Um, maybe by nailing my name, I get an extra 30 seconds and you won't yank me off the screen. Um, again, 
thrilled to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give a, a two, quick, quick tutorial on LIDAR, even though I'm sure a number of you already know what this is. It's a sensor that emits millions of uh, pulses of light per second into its surroundings, creating a 3D map of its environment in real time. This enables automation, safe navigation in a number of different um, applications. Uh, this sensor in particular was mounted on a vehicle in San Francisco. You'll notice it's got extremely high resolution, so you can tell what the objects are in front of it just by the raw LIDAR data, but it does not collect biometric information like facial recognition, skin tone, or other details like that. So cities are looking at LIDAR increasingly right now um, as a privacy enhancing as well as equity enhancing technology to use in the public space. Um, Velodyne Lighter has a number of applications, like I said, across a variety of sectors. Today, we will be focusing on our smart city and intelligent infrastructure applications. But as you can see from this slide, we do have a number of different um, use cases and, and deployments around the world. Some of the problems we're solving. This should be fairly straightforward, but every city, every community is going to have their own their own issues that they're turning to technology and solutions for. Congestion, pollution, um, and safety are, are three of the primary areas that we're looking to in our intelligent transportation systems. And as you can see from that lower level, um, ITS really does have a meaningful uh, value proposition here in addressing these problems. Most pervasive, however, we are talking to a number of cities and state DOTs, especially with respect to their Vision Zero programs and trying to increase safety on the roadway. So um, as recently as a couple, uh, a week or two ago, uh, the Governor's Highway Safety Association uh, released a report showing that there was a 17% increase in pedestrian fatalities from 2020, and the vast majority of states saw an increase. Now, why is this happening? Um, vehicle and traffic technologies are continuing to improve, but even this reflects what NHTSA has been reporting in the last few rounds of FARS data that we are actually seeing an increase in vulnerable road user uh, fatalities and serious injuries. And there is a disproportionate impact on people of color as well as nighttime um, safety risk. So that is something where LIDAR in particular brings um, a, a, specific value, a specific value to infrastructure. Um, I should mention here as well, um, recently this year, uh, Velodyne, um, won the uh, 2022 Innovation Award at South by Southwest, and we are starting to get recognized for our smart city applications. Um, so we're really excited about that. It's starting to um, gain more traction. And I think, um, especially again, from the safety perspective, uh, viewing these technologies as, as they mature is really, really important for the public sector. Um, so I've already mentioned the equity enhancing and privacy um, related aspects of the technology, um, but in particular, because we are seeing a lot of safety risk at night or in low light conditions, this is one area where LIDAR literally shines um, because it can perform at night and in low light and different weather conditions. Um, it also has the ability to distinguish between different types of road users because of that high resolution that you see with the sensing technology, like the difference between types of vehicles, pedestrians, bikes, and other roadway obstructions. Um, also, uh, as you drive through your city or town, you'll notice in many cases a number of sensing, uh, uh, either um, sensors or different types of materials around an intersection. Um, the benefit of LIDAR, in particular, a scanning LIDAR, like our 360 degree scanning LIDAR, um, can cover one entire intersection in most cases with just a single sensor. So that re really reduces in a meaningful way maintenance and cost. And we do have the ability and uh, to plug into a city's uh, fiber, but we are LTE and 5G connected, which does enable that real time access to data and playback that cities are using to analyze the data that they're receiving through our um, API. Now, moving on to the real meat of the presentation here. Uh, one of our, this is from one of our customers in Canada who are using camera sensing across North America and Europe. You'll see in um, the screen crap captures here, this is showing what LIDAR on the left hand side here. Um, looks like versus a camera grab in low light and rainy conditions. And what they found when they compared the two solutions was that even using two cameras in the right hand side to grab the same view of that intersection that one LIDAR sensor um, was using, we saw a 2.6% increase in accuracy, which is a really meaningful um, metric when you're talking about safety performance. And so here we've got a project um, that Velodyne has with New Jersey DOT. You'll see the same intersection represented three times here. And you'll see near-miss vehicle-to-vehicle conflict analysis. The sensor is located here with a heat map 
in the intersection where you see the green circles turning to red when there are near misses within the safety window. I'm going to move uh, quickly and apologize for time here. Pedestrian to vehicle, uh, red light running. Um, in one case, the city saw red lights being missed. They saw when they were happening, went down to that intersection and figured out it was because of a glare coming off of a building. So they decided to install trees that didn't lose their foliage at different times of the year so that they could help with that glare um, problem with the drivers. Finally, we've got um, a situation here with pedestrian vehicle conflict analysis. They noticed that there were pedestrians, as you'll see up at the top here, crossing outside of the crosswalk. It was because actually down here, you'll see the buses were dropping pedestrians off in the middle of the roadway. And so the city found that they needed to find a solution to move that foot traffic down to the intersection so that they could remove that um, the passengers are the coming off of the buses and darting between traffic to get to the other side of the roadway. Finally, again, using data to solve problems here, we've got a connected vehicle application that shows here on the bottom left, the at about five seconds, you'll notice this cyclist notification coming to the driver. And as they drive, they finally see the cyclist crossing in front of them. But before that, it was not within their field of view. Same thing here. We've got our test vehicle, the red vehicle here, coming to a stop, turning right. You see the cyclist even before the driver had it within their field of view. So this is us solving real problems, adding, adding meaningful upgrades to Cities ITS, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to present it. Thank you. Oh, man. That, that's a tight brief right there. Two schedule, Christina. Fantastic job. Thank you. Who would have thought? that putting trees in the garden state would save people's lives. And, and you saw it right here on that pitch. All right, next up, we're gonna talk with Reed Zaghetti. Ah, oh, man, I'm nailing these names today. Um, Reed's coming to us from Spoke. And so we just talked about cyclist safety and now we're really gonna talk about cyclist safety. Reed, you have the floor. Honored to be here, ladies and gentlemen. And Christina, thanks for that fantastic lead in. Here's how I believe the amplification of, uh, of our uh, mutually beneficial technologies uh, can benefit society. Spoke is about being seen. Spoke is about protecting the most vulnerable on our roadways. And when we started our initiative, we looked at uh, the fact that there's about 4 billion between the US and Europe, 4 billion bicycles in service today. Uh, where 45 million bicycles are sold in North America and EU combined annually. And none of those bicycles are connected today. So um, what Spoke uh, took the challenge to do was develop VRU to X, um, which is allowing bicycles, motorcycles, scooters, and pedestrians to be seen by cars and for those VRUs to see cars. For the first time in human history, we've taken CVDX technology LTE, 5G technology, and camera technology, and reduced it to a form factor suitable for a bicycle, such that um, the modules disappear into things that we would normally see as a bicycle camera or a bicycle computer or a bicycle light. So here's the bad news, and this is the problem we're solving for. In the past 10 years, according to the NHTSA database, there's been a 37% increase in bicycle fatalities Unfortunately, the numbers aren't any better in Europe, uh, 32, 37% in Europe as well. Here are the top five killers, we know them. Christina just showed you one, which was the right hook scenario. Um, these are the top five killers and these kill people at intersections and also between intersections. The other bad news is while infrastructure can do a lot to support, according to a five-year NHTSA study, 57% of the bicycle to vehicle fatalities that occur not at an intersection. So we need to solve for all those. About 72%, according again to the NHTSA database, of the motorists involved in an accident, uh, the root cause, when they finally did slow it down, it's very simple. They just didn't see the cyclist. So what Spoke has done is introduced uh, VRU to X technology, which is a synthesis of, together with Qualcomm, uh, CV to X technology, as well as uh, cloud capability, thanks to Amazon Web Services, um, who has helped build Reed, out. Reed, sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing slides in case you are sharing them. You're not seeing them. 
Well, that's disappointing. I indeed was sharing them. There you go. That's great. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Uh, thanks for telling me that. Um, so what you missed were these slides here with the fatalities. And then most common sources of the fatalities that we didn't see them, the VRU to X, the press releases that we've had as a result of our partnership with Qualcomm uh, and also with uh, Amazon Web Services. And this is asked tongue in cheek, but really from a cyclist perspective or for a vulnerable road user perspective. Do you really think I care about the pedigree of the car that just ran me over? I don't, I just didn't want to get ran over. So what cyclists would like to have is a system that sees all cars and that provides the highest percentage of cars that can see them. Um, and they like that now, not later, because after all, 37% of us uh, are, are is, a, is a big number. So what we've delivered is three levels of connectivity. The first is CV to X in a very small size form factor. Take a pizza box, which is about the size of a module in a car today, and reduce it down to uh, an iPhone 4 size. And at 10 times per second, we've implemented all the basic safety messages together with our partner Qualcomm. Additionally, what we've done is because not every vehicle on the road is going to have CVDX capability in the near term. There are vehicles with a tremendous amount of modems and also people with the brought in mobile phone turns that car into a virtual modem. So with our partners, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, with uh, over 200,000, excuse me, 200 million vehicles enacted. And our partners, Mapbox in here with over 600 million active daily users. We're knocking on the door of about a billion vehicles out there that we can reach by redacting those uh, basic safety messages into 5G LTE, two to four seconds. And in most cases, we're under a second with of latency. And for that 1972 Chevelle, which is not connected, we're also using optical sensors as well to visually connect vehicles. And we just launched uh, at the Seattle Classic uh, and People for Bikes with our partner Audi, anonymous just-in-time uh, alerts, providing real-time communication between that Audi cluster and the vehicle cockpit. We've displaced, as I mentioned, what people are already putting on their bikes and increasingly so at about a 9% compounded annual growth rate of bicycle computers and with third-party apps through mobile phones. And we've also dropped in uh, the camera system to be able to detect a vehicle that is not connected. I'm sorry for that snafu of not having the, the share button properly clicked. However, let me say that if you watch this video here, just one second, you will see. It is time to connect the complete mobility ecosystem. Introducing VRU2X. Not the first the connected way. IoT ecosystem for vulnerable road users, delivering contextual awareness and insight for each moment of the journey. This is possible because of Spokeware. Hey, hey Reed, we're not seeing the video if you're uh, on the sharing again. Connectivity. Yeah. Well, that's go ahead, yeah, go ahead and share, and then I, we can hear it. There we go. Wow, now that's, so this is definitely a bug. I'm a daily user here, and we, Dry run this a minute ago. Sorry, let's start. The automotive over. grade hardware that ensures for the first time ever vulnerable road users can be digitally seen by cars in that they see the vehicles around them before the naked eye. VRU2X is three levels of connectivity with integrated solutions that deliver immediate anonymous safety alerts, make riders visible and able to see around them, and connect to the mobility ecosystem and rich rider insights. Spokeware is a complete cockpit and computing experience that digitally connects riders and equipment manufacturers, powering a comprehensive mobility UX experience. For the first time, putting vulnerable road users at the center of the mobility ecosystem.
tubes feel connected. Again, my apologies. We draw around that perfectly. So uh, thanks for letting me share that opportunity with you all. Hey, hey, Reed, the, the video is fantastic and we didn't have, we, it didn't get laggy on us. So good deal. Good deal. I'm, I'm calling it a success. Great. I'm calling it a success. And the guy didn't get run over by that truck. So super bonus on that video. Um, and so I like the fact that you can put it in a 72 Chevelle. You can get a 72 Chevelle probably for about 50,000 bucks right now. Um, if you not, if you want a nice one. Um, and Christina's LIDAR seeing that Chevelle and so is the spoke equipped bike. There you go. All right. Was, uh, ben, I was just gonna add also just encourage everyone as you look at these presentations, please share. We'll be sharing and, and just so everyone knows we share the videos afterwards. Um, so, uh, uh, Reed, we can, uh, re-record this <laughs> if we need to, but, um, but we share, you know, but part of our goal here is not just this tech showcase, but beyond that, we're going to be sharing the videos with everyone because, um, so please reach out to Reed and team, and especially some of our participants on the local uh, and municipalities. Um, so we'll be sending it out as well. So thanks, Reed. All right. My pleasure. Thank you all. Next up, we've got Chuck Stockton from Valor Fleet, um, who has has a defense application um, in addition to commercial applications for his technology, uh, which falls in my previous uh, wheelhouse of ground systems and in, in defense mobility. Uh, Chuck, we're going to bring you up and, and give you the floor. There we are. Oh, we just got to get you off mute, Chuck. There we go. Sounds good. Counts are good. Floor is yours, Chuck. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, join the conference today. Uh, Raj, Jack, everyone. Uh, let me get our screen share active here. How's the visuals? Everything okay? Looks great. Yeah, looks good. So what I wanted to do today is start. My name is Charlie Stockton. I am uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Valor Holdings. Uh, we are a defense contractor. Uh, we work primarily in the vehicle space. Uh, most of my background has been fleet related. I've worked with uh, uh, various uh, municipalities, uh, DOTs, uh, Indiana Department of Transportation uh, being one. Uh, we uh, helped put together their alternative fuel program uh, back uh, when the uh, era monies came available in 2009. I uh, was really uh, proud to be associated with that project. Uh, we converted most of uh, uh, the Indiana DOT's fleet to run on compressed natural gas, uh, propane, uh, depending on what the application was. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I've always had a passion for new technologies uh, specific to those that are improving the environment, and uh, of which one is one that we are introducing uh, as a emerging technology uh, in the DOD space primarily right now. Uh, this is what we refer to as hydrogen on demand. Uh, it is a non-mechanical hydrogen power generation system. Get to the next screen here. So our tech overview for HOD has stated it is non-mechanical hydrogen uh, on demand. Uh, it has several tactical and practical advantages for clean energy power generation. Uh, we use a patented EnviroCatalyst fuel source, uh, which is composed of minerals recovered uh, mostly from waste streams in North America, and it contains no rare earths, uh, which is obviously a positive uh, particularly for the warfighter, uh, but when you think about even for civilian applications. Uh, we use the uh, uh, e-catalyst in conjunction with water. Uh, that water can be from virtually any source. It could be potable, non-potable, uh, anything that's readily available. 
and the technology is adaptable for both mobile and static applications. So one thing that differentiates our technology from uh, uh, most of those uh, in the hydrogen space is that our system is, is low pressure. Uh, it runs at uh, less than 100 PSI. Uh, it also is um, uh, very uh, low voltage, so it mitigates the volatility risk associated with mechanical hydrogen production. Uh, the fuel that we use, the ECAT, uh, it can come in you know, plate format, rods or pellets, and with water, it does provide inert energy production. It is 100% eco-friendly. It's totally benign after use. Uh, the ECAP fuel can be easily uh, disposed of, it can be recycled, and, and it contains no harmful elements. And there are also no uh, special uh, protective, uh, uh, protective gear. Uh, the handling and storage of the ECAP fuel is very simple. It's basically like any other material. Uh, it's actually much easier. Uh, there are any hazmat factors uh, when compared to diesel, for instance. So when we put this slide deck together, this is primarily focused on the warfighter, and then we can transition to more of a civilian application and some ideas we have for that as well. Uh, but some of these will apply in both cases. You know, uh, our system does not require any fueling infrastructure. It will create hydrogen power on site as needed. It is great for charging batteries in the field, or in the case of a civilian application, it would be in a mobile uh, uh, situation uh, for, say, a rural area, very remote areas where it's difficult to, to have uh, charging for batteries. Uh, there is no thermal signature. Uh, it's, you know, for the most part, uh, very quiet uh, with minimal acoustic signature. Uh, and it operates in variable operating environments, uh, including Arctic applications. Uh, we paired up with a, uh, a capacitor, an e-cell capacitor, uh, which we uh, currently uh, are working with a company that has uh, the product up in the oil sands in Canada, and it's performing very well. Our power right now is scalable. Uh, you know, that output range is from 5 watts to 500 kilowatts. And we're currently using this as uh, a technology for powering batteries that can be used for hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, for the warfighter, that would be your comms gear, augmented reality and eye vision goggles, and any other soldier mission energy needs in austere operating environments. What we have here is a prototype rendering of a product uh, here. Uh, this is uh, Poisson, which is one of our teaming uh, company members. Uh, we have multiple projects we're engaging with Poisson in. Uh, this is their atom. It's the all-terrain electric emission module. Uh, it's used to provide uh, uh, electrification uh, our batteries uh, from the individual soldier level to uh, you know different squad and platoon levels. Uh, what you see on the right side is uh, the rendering of our system. Uh, this is using plates for the ECAT uh, delivery and. It powers the banks of batteries that are on the Atom trailer. For the sake of time, we won't take it through the YouTube video, but uh, when we distribute this after the call, I'd invite anyone to take a look at um, this video. So practical advantages, you know, the HOD technology, it delivers clean power generation, uh, could be for electric vehicle charging. It can be used for even onboard charging, uh, uh, something that we're not at a technical readiness level, Yet, uh, something we would like to explore with help from maybe some of the folks that are on the call today. Uh, you know, we're looking at this for off-grid applications in remote areas, uh, rural communities uh, that just don't have the access uh, to some of the newer technologies. Uh, we think that they, they are vulnerable populations and we can help in that regard. You know, we also see this as a means for uh, powering uh, unmanned air vehicles. Uh, you know, the charging to extend their range. Uh, that could be for both military and civilian applications as well. Uh, when you think of civilian, you think about uh, rural package delivery. Uh, that final mile is a pretty long way out there uh, in some of the uh, more rural settings. So we feel like it, it could bring great value in that regard. One project that we're just starting to put together our, uh, uh, our proposal for is for uh, the Department of Energy's Arctic Act project. 
uh, Arctic X is uh, uh, it really focuses on the vulnerable populations of indigenous people uh, native to Alaska. Currently, uh, most of the uh, indigenous people are using uh, diesel generators. Uh, they're using that for their power. Uh, that obviously has a lot of logistical uh, concerns. Uh, uh, diesel fuel uh, is not easy to get out in the rural areas. Uh, it's hazardous. There's uh, spillage risk. And of course, harmful exhaust emissions from diesel uh, generators uh, are not good for the population, not, not to mention the environment. You know, the environmental effects can be uh, pretty hazardous. Our solution is obviously to use the HOD technology. Uh, you know, there's no uh, byproducts uh, that can harm the environment. Uh, it's very safe to move and deploy, and uh, there's a lot of water readily accessible in Alaska. So we feel like it is a true, clean, renewable alternative energy source. We are uh, the prime contractor uh, for uh, multiple contracts. Uh, one we have stated here is a mobility platform prototyping project we have uh, with uh, Naval Service Workers Center Crane, uh, enhancing uh, uh, existing uh, vehicle platforms. We're looking to translate that into the commercial space as well. And our company, uh, we really kind of think of ourselves as Wolfpack. Uh, we operate uh, with uh, various social economic designations. We have uh, one uh, company, which is a, a woman-owned business, a hub zone business. And of course, uh, Valor is a disabled veteran-owned small business. So we appreciate uh, everyone today for uh, letting us join the call. Uh, if you have any questions after it, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, uh, we thank you very much. And I'll kick it back to Ben. All right, I appreciate it, Chuck. Um, so that was Chuck from Valor Holdings or Valor, Valor Fleet. And now we're going to finish up with Jamie Gold from Talent Air. So we're, we're going to, I think we're moving on from hydrogen fuel to, to the systems that would possibly use hydrogen fuel. Um, so Chuck, go ahead and unshare your screen and we'll bring Jamie up to close it out. <laughs> All right, Jamie, welcome. Excited to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, was my screen up? It is. Looks good. All right, cool. Yeah, uh, I'm Jamie, the CEO and co-founder of Talon. Uh, we're focused on batteries for now, but hydrogen is definitely a possibility in the future. So just a brief background that I think everybody on this call is probably familiar with, but there's a lot of logistics challenges uh, right now that are just getting worse. Uh, there's unreliable roads, a massive truck driver shortage, and air cargo is still too expensive and often still requires a ground lake anyway, so it has the same other problems. And there's a new wave of solutions coming called electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So these are fully electric aircraft. They don't need a runway. So you can go point to point. So you can eliminate that ground leg. And they're bringing down the cost of existing air transportation to, to make that more available to everybody. And this is how we're doing it. Uh, it's a very unique way to attack this. My co-founder and I were at SpaceX for five years. And we're applying the thinking behind stage rockets to aircraft to get large performance benefits. It's a two-stage system. So there's a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that gets a fixed wing aircraft up in the air. They transition to forward flight together, they separate. And then you've got a fixed wing platform that's much lighter than a VTOL platform, doesn't have all the drag mass and power mismatch problems that those do. So it can fly much further ranges, uh, more efficiently, all on batteries, then performs a mid-air docking with another VTOL vehicle, which is the really hard technical challenge that we're solving right now. Uh, and they transition back to vertical flight and do a vertical landing. Nobody else is doing it this way. Uh, we're in early tech development right now, flying subscale and scaling up with the Air Force. The verticals we're looking at are military, cargo, and parcels, and ag. Uh, on the military side, we've got multiple SBIRs with the Air Force for a variety of use cases. 
Um, and they funded us through as four phase two SBIRs and then a tactical finance increase uh, to build full scale prototypes. So we kicked off that program in December. Uh, we'll start building those in about a month. We're in full design phase right now. These are 2000 pound aircraft, so they're real aircraft. And like I said, we're currently flying subscale uh, to demonstrate our technology. These are essentially what you would think of as a drone. It's a 50 pound system. Uh, cargo and parcels. This is the commercial use case. Uh, this is things like middle mile logistics for things that are valuable. People want them quickly and they don't wanna pollute. It's also quiet. So uh, a good sector is pharma. So move drugs around, organs around, uh, blood samples. Again, things that are light, people want them very fast and you can do it point to point and eliminate the ground legs and eliminate any uh, more expensive air legs. In the agricultural space, we're looking at surveillance and data acquisition. Uh, so flying long ranges over fields to gather intelligence uh, for farmers to see how their crops are doing, when they should plant, uh, how the grazing is affecting it, soil quality, all those things. The other is uh, the application of spray. So putting down fertilizers um, to help those, uh, those plants grow better. Mentioned briefly, but the company was founded by myself and Evan, both former SpaceX engineers for five years. We've got some awesome advisors and test pilots and other uh, aerospace founders behind us. We have a team of 14 right now, uh, hiring up to 20 to move from our subscale up to our full scale aircraft. Uh, thanks, and this is a picture of us flying out in the Southern California desert with our subscale prototypes. Uh, would love to talk to anybody in the public sector interested in this for uh, any sort of demo missions, uh, if anybody's working with beyond visual line of sight corridors. Uh, we do have that DOD traction I mentioned, but we're always looking for new use cases and new customers in the DOD. Uh, and anybody in agriculture who wants to talk about applications uh, with data and spray. Thanks. Oh, very cool, Jamie. Um, I love the I love the solution, right? You want you want EV tall, but you want a bigger payload, and how do you manage it, right? Exactly. Um, very cool solution. All right, so so we, we got to hear from everybody. I'm a nice guy. I don't usually cut people off, even though I threaten it. Um, but we now we have some opportunities for some follow up questions with these folks. Um, Chris, I'm going to bring Kristen back up. She's going to field those questions. I might throw in a question or two if people don't throw them in. Um, but for if you have any questions for any of the four companies, we'll bring Christina and Reed and Jamie and Chuck back up. Um, pop it in the Q&A or mistakenly in the chat. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, and let's talk to these companies about what they have going on. I will check real quick and then I'm going to drop Ben's personal questions that he wants to know about if I don't see them. And we'll um, ask Jamie to come back on on camera. We did actually ask our participants to think about a few questions, recognizing that we might have a cold audience at first. So the first question we asked to this audience is, we know partnership is critical. You already talked, each of you, about some of the partnerships you've already developed. So I'd be curious to hear from each and any one of you, um, what do you think is successful to a partnership in the tech deployment space? And how are you approaching partnerships in the public, research, and nonprofit sectors to advance your work? Um, I'd be happy to hear from any one of you and uh, love to open it up. I'll start. Um, <laughs> Just to get... uh, go ahead. Go. Let's go, oh. Jamie, and then Christina, and then Reed. Ben. Yeah, I mean, so what we're working on, it has to have uh, work with a lot of different public sectors. So you've got to get FAA clearance, you've got to integrate with airspace, you have to have work with uh, a variety of the state governments to work on the beyond visual line of sight um, certificates. So it's a broad partnership um, in the civilian world. And then in the military world, it's all partnerships, like everything we do there. Uh, about a third of our funding comes from the DOD right now. Um, and there are best short-term customer, um, but we're looking at the public sector for the large expansion. And that's where ITS America and Public Spend Forum come help. I love it, Jamie. Uh, Christina, thanks. Sure. I think for us, like one of the best uh, things we've, we've observed in these partnerships is really working closely and collaborating early on to identify success 
um, metrics and objectives um, really shift the focus from like the technology or the or the existing um, system into what is the city or community trying to achieve, right? And and really getting an, a good understanding of how we're going to measure that. Understanding, you know, you have to remain some flex, uh, some measure of flexibility and uh, be nimble um, if, as things change. But in the piloting stage, in the initial and early deployments, having more of that data that you bring eventually to the procurement really helps things um, sort of smooth, uh, smooth that out at the back end. Excellent, excellent topic about data and performance metrics, and we can definitely figure out in future conversations how to scale that. Reed, you wanted to chime in. Rational self-interest. The key Ooh. to partnerships is rational self-interest. If you're asking somebody to do something that doesn't amplify their core business, or at least show them how to take their core business and, and go adjacent to it, you're going to fall to the bottom of their priority list, and we don't even go there. So are automakers producing vehicles that don't want to clock people? They are. Do they have all the tools that they need? They don't. We give them the tools they need by way of our embedded software or by our small world's smallest onboard unit for vehicles that are already on the road, like a delivery vehicle, Amazon, DHL, UPS, FedEx. They've got a lot of cars out there. They're rationally self-interested not to run over people. Uh, infrastructure partners, they want to create more value with their infrastructure. Christina and I discussed the fact that her LIDAR can detect a vehicle well down the road in plenty of time for either a modem based communication to our module or a CVDX 10 times per second communication base to let the mode to let the cyclist know, hey, that 72 Chevelle sun's in that guy's eyes. He doesn't see the the, the red light, he's going to plow that red light, for example. So, or in an evening situation, right, where, where a camera may not work as effectively and the LIDAR does. So I think that whether this is with Amazon Web Services or with Qualcomm or with Audi or with uh, Comsignia or with Iteris or with Capture or with Velodyne, rational self-interest. And if you can partner with someone in rational self-interest, they automatically lean forward because it amplifies their business. I love that. Throwing out a little Ayn Rand there for us, Reed. I like it on an afternoon. Chuck, we, we have to let you weigh in because you have such an innovative concept. Any thoughts on partnerships? Oh, certainly, Chris. And I, you know, I've always uh, enjoyed uh, the collaborations we have, uh, mainly working in the DOD space and with municipalities. Uh, I would encourage everyone to, uh, if you're not a member, uh, join your local Clean Cities coalitions. Uh, I found them to be a very helpful resource. Uh, you know, anytime you're looking at electrification and now with the infrastructure uh, uh, projects that are uh, being let, uh, you know, there are uh, many opportunities for companies to work, uh, improve all the aspects of infrastructure, clean transportation, and really getting that into some of the rural communities too. Uh, it's one thing I will uh, say the uh, Biden administration made a big focus on uh, pushing this out to ensure that rural communities as well as metropolitan areas are, are uh, under this program. Awesome. And with that, we're just about at time. I'll ask Ben to come back up. I want to thank all of you to Christina, Reed, Jamie had to leave a little early, everyone, and, and Chuck for the awesome innovations that you're steeped in, for Public Spend Forum for helping us host this conversation and the future conversations we'll be chatting about. Chuck actually teed it up perfectly. The IIJA has hundreds of billions of dollars in investment in these innovations in the future. So how do we help companies like this and the public sector benefit from this? Ben and Raj, any parting words? Yeah, I would say for all the companies that you heard today, head to GovShop.com when you're setting up your own and check out their profile and see what they got going on. Reach out to these companies, reach out to ITS America and see how you can get involved. And don't forget to apply for that accelerator by one o'clock in the morning, Friday Eastern time. Um, and we hope to see you in there. And we hope to see you at the next tech showcase. So again, thank you, Kristen. Uh, Thank you, Amazon Web Services. Thank you, uh, Freshwater Advisors. Thank you to the companies that pitched ultimately. And we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Bye now. <laughs>